I'm super pumped uh, about the first speaker that we've got um, for this weekend. I know we started Leaders Day yesterday and we had an incredible speaker yesterday, but this is really the start of um, the K2 Elite Weekend. And we've got an incredible guy coming in who I'm actually really excited to listen to myself. His name is Martin Moore. Uh, yeah, if, if you haven't seen the podcast where I interviewed him, I strongly encourage you to check him out. Uh, Martin Moore went from a university dropout, which is one of the things I love most about him, to the CEO of a multi-billion dollar business, having forged a successful 30 plus year career working for a range of blue chip companies across multiple industries. Martin is a leadership and organizational performance expert and founder of Your CEO Mentor. Martin held various senior executive roles, but is best known as the CEO who turned around CS Energy. He led his team to implement a sustainable culture change driving earnings growth from 18 million to 441 million, demonstrating a career agility before it was even trendy. Marty is now pursuing his true purpose, which is to improve the quality of leaders globally, and is a strong believer that leadership drives culture and culture drives performance, and we are big advocates of that. Marty is committed to helping organizations deliver real value, uplift through improving leadership capability and unlocking the potential of the human workforce. Ladies and gentlemen, can we do only what you guys know how to do? Please be very upstanding and welcome to the stage, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Martin Moore. Have fun, mate. Enjoy it. Well, thank you very much, everyone. It's great to be here. Fantastic to be in front of the K2 Elite. You guys are awesome. And it's really good that Kerwin's been here this morning warming you up for me. I really like that. But I've got to tell you, I'm going to start with a couple of confessions, right? The first thing is, I normally sleep really well at night. Okay, over the years, I've become really comfortable in my skin. I know who I am. I'm comfortable with how I live and how I do things. But just occasionally, in the early hours of the morning, I'll wake up in a cold sweat. And I'll realize that I've just had this dream where I have to walk on stage immediately after Kerwin Ray. <laughs> but that's okay. I'm going to put that behind me. The second confession is I'm actually from Brisbane. So do we have any people from Brisbane? Okay, fantastic. We have people from Brisbane. That's excellent, okay? But in business, I've learned to hedge my bets. So I was born and brought up in Sydney until I was 30 years old. So anyone from Sydney? Okay, so I've got most of you covered. That's fantastic. I'm really happy with that. And of course, these days, doing business on the east coast of Australia is super easy, right? So whether you're in Brisbane, Sydney, or Melbourne, you get anywhere really, really quickly. Not so in the USA. Now, I spend a fair bit of time over there. My wife's from Boston, and this will become obvious later through the presentation. But traveling in the US domestically is really, really difficult. And I was there a couple of months ago, and I got off this flight from Brisbane to LAX, and LAX is, if it's not the worst airport in the world, it's at least in the top one. <laughs> and I went into the check-in counter because I was going to get my Delta flight from LAX across to Boston. And I went up to the woman at the counter, and I said, look, I want this bag to come to Boston with me. I want my suit carry to go to JFK in New York because I've got a meeting there next week. And I want my golf clubs in Orlando, Florida, because I'm playing a couple of rounds with a friend before I come home. And she looked at me and she said, Mr. Moore, I'm terribly sorry, but that's impossible. And I looked at her and I said, well, apparently not, because last time I was here, that's exactly what you did to me. <laughs> this on, John? Check one, one, shoot one. So I just want to give you a little bit more about my background. It was a good introduction from Kerwin, but I just want to tell you a little bit about like where I came from and why I am where I am today, because I think it's quite important. I'm from the land of big corporates, right? Has anyone worked in large corporate before you decided to go into business for yourself? Can I show of hands? Oh, fantastic. You know what I'm talking about, which is great. But I came through a corporate career and made it to a reasonably high level, not based on what I know, right? What I know isn't what got me to where I got to. Because what you know is fleeting. You get to a certain point where you can't get results through your own individual brilliance any longer. You rely on the people around you to get those results. 
and having worked out through trial and error and having a bunch of scars to show for it, I've actually worked out what works, what makes a difference, and how to get the people around you to perform in a way that unlocks the potential of that workforce because it is the most underutilized and underrated source of value in an organization. So when I first moved to Queensland in 2001, 2002, I was working for a mining company. Never worked in the mining sector before. However, I had an executive role as chief information officer of a large ASX listed mining company. How did I get away with that? Right? Because I had people around me who I knew how to unlock their value. And I had a set of generic skills that I was able to use to add value to the technical and content-related skills of the people around me. I moved from there into the insurance industry. I knew nothing about the insurance industry. A specialist insurer of heavy motor risk. How did I get away with that? The same thing. I moved to transportation and logistics. How did I do that? Same thing. I'm going into industries where I know nothing about the industry. Until I get to the point where I'm chief executive of a big energy business. Right? We own coal-fired power stations. Not politically correct, I know, in these days. However, once you start thinking about coal-fired power stations, just remember, lights and air conditioning courtesy of us. You know, you're welcome. It's OK. Right? We still need that type of energy at the moment. And of course, the challenge is to transition as quickly as possible from a world that's driven by fossil fuel energy to a world that doesn't require that. Okay, we've got to get there as fast as we possibly can. But going to that situation, how many people in that company I walked into as chief executive welcomed me with open arms and said, Marty, your track record in the energy sector is sensational. We're so glad you're here. We're going to learn so much from you. You can guide this business to success. No one, zero, zilch, nada. But I knew how to take the people who were there with deep skills in that business and deep skills in the industry and unlock what they could do. So that's just by way of explanation about why I am where I am. And I think over the years, I've become pretty good at this leadership stuff. However, like anything else in life, the better you get, the more you see how much shit you don't know and how much you can't actually do. And so we've always got to be mindful of the self-awareness and the introspection and the reflection that's going to drive us to become better. So here we are and I still haven't got past my title slide. Is that okay? No. One thing I have learned about you guys, because I was here at Nissi in May, had a fantastic time. One thing I've learned about you guys is that if I ask you to show your hands, you will actually do that. So I'm going to test that now. I want to know, for those of you who are here, who has a business that is large enough that you have multiple layers in your business? It's not just you and some employees. You've got multiple layers, right? Qu okay, quite a few. That's awesome. Okay. That's when it gets really hard. That's when your individual brilliance goes out the door because all of a sudden, you've got to get your results through other people when you don't hold the levers. You can't pull the same value levers you used to when you could just jump in yourself and do it. Now, let's get this really clear up front. In your business, no one can, nor will they ever, be able to do it as well as you can, right? So, so get over that. Right? The trick is to know how to get the most out of the people that you're paying to do that job. So we're going to talk a bit about that in a few minutes. How many people have zero employees? It's just a man or a woman and a dog in a garage? That's fantastic. Some of the stuff I'm going to talk about today, you might not necessarily resonate with, but you'll come back in the future and you'll watch this video once every six months for the next 10 years, I'm sure. And you'll come back to stuff and you go, okay, now that makes sense. I understand what you were talking about. All right, let's get on with it. Leadership drives culture, culture drives performance. This is an absolute truism. If you want performance out of your business, it's the culture that will determine whether that performance is good, bad, or indifferent. And I've seen so much over the years that I'm a firm believer in this as a fact. Right? It's axiomatic because the culture is something that you can't necessarily see. Every business has a culture. If there is you and one other person in your proximity, there is a culture that develops. Culture is simply about the way we do things around here. That's all it is. It's the accepted norms of behavior. It's how we do things. 
and a culture will develop. Whether you like it or not, you have a culture. Whether it's good or bad, you have a culture. Whether it's constructive or destructive, you have a culture. And the thing about a culture is that it is what it is and it will not change unless a leader, so in case you notice, that's you guys, you've all got to identify with this, right? You're all leaders. Unless a leader does something different to make it change. And this is why when I say leadership drives culture and culture drives performance, if you can actually link to the performance of your business and say an improvement in culture is going to improve the overall performance of the business and you believe that, and you can learn to lead the people to get the best out of them and to stretch them and to get them to perform in a way that they couldn't perform without you as their leader, then you've hit the jackpot. And that's how you're really going to take it forward. However, we spend so much of our time thinking about the hard skills of business, the quantifiable things that sit right in front of us every day and are highly visible. And look, that's absolutely appropriate. Right? I'm not saying to take your eye off that ball. What I'm saying is, if you could treat the people and the culture with the same level of diligence and the same level of respect and the same level of effort and the same level of energy, you'd get completely different results. So let me just give you a few examples to bring this to life. Um, let's say I work for you. And I come up to you one day and I say, Hey, look, Susie, you know this deal that I've been negotiating that we think's worth $10 million? Well, I was thinking overnight, and I'm not sure whether we'll actually get the $10 million of value created, and it's going to take a really long time. So I reckon we should just settle now for $5 million and move on. What would you think of me if I came up to you and said that? It would be completely ridiculous that I would suggest leaving $5 million of value on the table because I thought something was going to be hard and it was going to take too long. However, the equivalent with our people goes something like this. And I have heard these words come out of a senior leader's mouth. This is not hypothetical. Marty, I know Jeff isn't performing to the standard we're trying to set, but I'm really busy at the moment and I haven't got time to performance manage Jeff. And besides, I'm not sure if he'll ever actually reach that bar we're setting, but he knows all these other things, so I think we should just leave him in place, right? I haven't got time to do something that's gonna create value for the organization. So I haven't left $5 million on the table. We don't know how much gets left on the table when we don't deal with Jeff. Okay, let's try another one. Um, we're just about to release a product to market. And you're the boss, and I come to you and I say, hey, Joe, look, this product we're releasing next week, I know we've done all the market research, I know we've done our competitor analysis, and I know that we know that the price that that, market should be put in, uh, that product should be put into the market at is $495. But I was thinking overnight, as we do, and I figured that if we release the product for $295, then our customers will really love us because we'll be giving them a bargain. It's completely unthinkable that you would have a product that you were confident you could sell at a certain price point and to discount it so that your customers liked you more. But once again, when it comes to the people stuff, we find it really easy to use that as an excuse. So for example, I know my team is not at its highest level of performance at the moment, but I really need the team to like me. And if the team likes me, I'll get more value out of them. And if I get more value out of them, that's going to be good. So I'm just going to leave it exactly the way it is. So we use that as an excuse for not actually changing the people in the culture. I could go on and on. I'll give you one more, right? Let's say you're going to set up a partnership with someone. And you do an analysis and you've got a couple of potential partners. And at the end of it, I come to you and I say, hey, Jeremy, I know we've been looking at this partnership for a little while. Company A has everything we need. They've got the right culture, the right products, the right risk processes. They've got everything in place that we need. But you know what? I really like the CEO from Company B. So I reckon we should go with Company B. Completely ridiculous, completely counterintuitive. Yet we think nothing of saying things like, uh, look, I know that um, 
Christine is the best person for this job, but she's a bit prickly sometimes, and everyone really likes Kieran, so I'm going to promote Kieran instead of Christine, because it'll be a more popular decision. This sort of stuff happens every single day, and this is part of your culture. And so when we think about the culture of, as Kerwin was talking about earlier, flow of information. What does the culture tell your people are the accepted norms for information flows? So I've, I got stung by this, I don't know, 20 years ago. I got blindsided by something that went wrong. And so I actually built a new little piece into my welcome speech. So when, any, when anyone new started working for me, I'd sit them down, we'd have a little welcome speech, here's how the place works, here's what I expect from you, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I built something onto the back end of that, where I used to say, there's only one thing that's really going to have you fall foul of me. If you have some bad news or something goes wrong and you don't tell me about it, you are actually robbing me of my ability to manage that situation. You are stealing my capability and my opportunity to make a difference. And I'll look on that really, really dimly. So the culture we have here is summed up like this. Bad news by rocket, good news by rickshaw. Right? Bad news by rocket, good news by rickshaw. I want to know bad news straight away. Then I can do something about it. And I talked to people years afterwards, after that first conversation, people that I've worked with, we're very close and so forth. And they say, you know, the one thing I remember you about you in our first meeting was, oh my God, don't mess with Marty on this one, right? That's, that's going to be career ending for me. And I probably didn't want to emphasize it quite that much, but this is how you set culture. And you reinforce it by the way you do things every day, by the way you carry yourself around your workplace. Very important. It's one of my favorite quotes. The secret of leading people is to keep the guys who hate you away from the guys who are still undecided. Now, it's, it's tongue-in-cheek, of course. This guy had a very dry sense of humor, Casey Stengel. He was a Major League Baseball manager back in the olden days. But it makes a very important point. We are driven predominantly by the need to be liked. But as leaders, we have to learn to set that aside. And it's really important that we learn this. Do you know why? Because having a goal as a leader of being liked and being universally liked is impossible to achieve. It's actually impossible. Not everyone likes you in life, not everyone is going to like you on the job. When I walked into CS Energy every morning, I knew that at least 5% of the people in that company were going to hate me for no apparent reason. My haircut, my suit and tie, my title, whatever, didn't matter. Now, there are a bunch of others that hated me with really good reason, but 5% of the people, they, they were going to hate me no matter what. I had no opportunity to change that, so guess what? Suck it up, cupcake. Get over it. If you want to be a strong leader who gets results, and when I talk about results, I'm not just talking about bottom line results. I'm talking about results that are best for everyone involved. Customers, external stakeholders, shareholders, talent, and of course, the performance of the business. If you want to do that, you better learn to let go of the need to be liked. Now, interesting, excuse me. Interestingly, over the last few years, there's been a lot of talk around leadership of leadership attributes, desirable attributes for a leader to have. And I find this conversation fun and interesting, but very fluffy and not particularly useful. So we hear things like, you know, well, great leaders are humble. Well, I don't know, are they? I know a couple of great leaders who struggle with their humility, but I tell you what, Jesus, they're decisive, right? Great leaders are transparent. Well, sure, okay, that's an important attribute. Great leaders are fallible, okay? Maybe. We're talking about attributes that are personal attributes that may or may not make a great leader because great leaders have to do what, first and foremost? Get results, right? You've got to get results. If you don't, well, like, what's the point in you being there? So great leaders have to get results. So this whole concept of desirable leadership attributes translates 
into people thinking things like, I need to be liked. People have to like me as a leader. And as a leader, if they like me, that's great because I can do what? I can keep them happy. Right? Because we all know that happy workers are productive workers, right? We all know that? Yep. No, 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 no. No, it's bullshit, right? It's not true. Happy workers may be productive workers, or they may not be. Sometimes happy workers are just happy workers. And this is a really important point. You should constantly question every piece of information that comes in front of you. And when your people come up to you and they say, listen, boss, this, 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 this is the way it is. The most important question you can ask, what is your evidence for that? Like, what's your evidence for that? People make statements all the time and they present them as if they're true. They're automatically true. But most of the time, it's hunches, innuendo, stuff they've picked up on social media, things they've observed with a sample set of one. Okay, it's not necessarily the case that that's true. So always be questioning, is that true? I don't know, it sounds true. So happy workers, productive workers, well, that sounds reasonable, that sounds true. And it's been supported over the last few years with a bunch of research that comes out and says, happy workers are productive workers. No, no, it's not. You know, we'll talk about what productive workers are in a little while. But just know this. Has anyone ever studied statistics? Show of hands. Few, okay, quite a few. Okay, fantastic, right? There is a massive difference between causation and correlation. Right, so what people talk about a lot in research is a correlation. I'm going to explain this in a minute. It's not a causal link. A causal link between two things is where one physically causes the other, and they're intrinsically linked, and they don't change. So, for example, altitude and temperature. That's a causal relationship. As you go up higher in altitude, it gets colder. That's the way it works. It's a physical property, and it is a causal relationship. So, as you get to the top of a mountain, it's a lot colder than it is at sea level. And as you get up in a plane, even on a lovely Brisbane day, at 38 degrees and 187% humidity, it's still minus 50 at 38,000 feet. Right? There's a causal relationship there, as opposed to a correlation of two variables. So, for example, smoking and alcoholism. If you're a smoker, you may be an alcoholic. And if you're an alcoholic, it's much more likely that you smoke. But guess what? No one is going to claim that alcoholism causes you to smoke. And no one is going to claim that being a smoker causes you to be an alcoholic. And so when you see information presented that says, here's the way the world works, happy works are productive workers, question it and think about it. Is it a correlation or is it a causal effect? I have a very strong view about what makes people productive. And we're going to talk about this a bit more, but it's all about are they stretched? Do they have impact? Are they working on things that actually satisfy a higher purpose than just the day-to-day -day mechanics of what they're doing? What is it that makes people stretch themselves and give you discretionary effort? It's the job of a leader. How do you get discretionary effort out of people? And the whole thing about culture is, culture can be described as what people do when you're not looking. What does the environment tell them that they should do? What are the behavioural norms when you're not there? How do they actually deal with that? And what do they do? And you need to be confident as your businesses grow and get bigger and bigger and bigger and there are more layers there because guess what? You can't put your hands on the, on the execution levers yourself. You're relying on other people to do that for you. And if you are running an organisation with thousands of people and five or six layers below you, you have no chance of knowing what's going on. So we can all sit there and watch the news bulletin and all get highly disgruntled by Ian Narev, the chief executive of the Commonwealth Bank of Australia, who on his watch had all this stuff happen underneath, some of which was criminal and a lot of which was unethical or immoral, and he carries the can for that. He's the CEO. And that's why he gets paid six, seven, eight million, eight million dollars a year. But how much 
control do you think he has over what goes on underneath him? How much control do you think he has? It's an organisation of, you know, 55,000 people, global organisation. He has no control as the leader. He doesn't hold those performance levers himself. But what he has to do is to make sure that the leadership and culture that goes through the organisation means that at any point in time, individuals will make the right choices that are consistent with the culture that he's trying to create. So this is the trick. The bigger your organisation gets, the harder it is to control that. Does anyone know who that is? Okay, it's a guy by the name of Tom Brady. I'm going to have fun with this story, right? A guy by the name of Tom Brady. Did anyone listen to the um, Unstoppable episode I did with Kerwin? Show of hands. A few. Okay, well, you might, I'm going to tell the story again, right? Because I love it. And as Kerwin said earlier, you've got to have fun in business. So this is my 10 minutes where I get to have fun, okay? Tom Brady is an American football player. He's an American football quarterback. He's known over there as the GOAT. Right? He's the greatest of all time. And I was going to put a photo of a goat up, but I thought it might be a little bit obscure, and I didn't know what you'd think of me if I had a, if I had a goat up there. But Tom Brady is known as the greatest of all time in the sport of American football, which is one of the most competitive sports on the planet. And now, the sports journalists over there are having the conversation, is he the best sportsman of all time? How does he compare to Michael Jordan and Tiger Woods and LeBron James? So they're having that conversation. How did he get there? And I, I will make a point, don't worry. But I just love this story. Tom was drafted by the New England Patriots out of college, and they have a college draft system over there, so the best players coming out of college go into the NFL. And he was drafted as the 199th pick in the year 2000 by the New England Patriots. So in other words... He only just made it, scraped into his draft class in the top 200. Yet here we are, 18, 19 years later, and he's the greatest player of all time. So what happened in between? Well, the first thing is, when Tom first went in there, he was number four in the quarterback depth chart. So what that means is, they've got a starting quarterback, They've got three reserve quarterbacks, and out of those three, guess what? Tom's the bottom of the pile. He's the fourth best quarterback in that one team out of the 32 teams. By the next year, he'd worked his way up to number two on the depth chart. So in other words, he was considered to be the first reserve if anything happened to the starter. As it turns out in 2001, starting quarterback gets injured, Tom comes on, and the rest is history. And that year, they won the Super Bowl. That's the, the top American football team out of the 32 that play on the most competitive sport on the planet. They won again in 2003 with Thomas Quarterback. They won again in 2004. So three out of the first four years that he joined the league, the team won the Super Bowl. Now, you've got to understand that this market, this NFL market in the US, it's designed so that that can't happen. It's designed so that the same team can't, winning, can't, can't keep winning. And the way it's designed like that is they have the draft preference. So, for example, New England Patriots win the Super Bowl. The next year, their first pick out of the college players coming through is number 32. That's their first pick. So, 31 other teams get a crack at the talent before they do. And they have salary caps so that everyone has to stay within the cap. There's a whole bunch of things that are put in place to make sure that you can't keep winning. Like the same team doesn't keep winning. Yet in the last 18 years, under Brady's leadership, they've won six Super Bowls in 18 years, and they've been to the Super Bowl nine times. So every other year, the New England Patriots is one of the two teams in the Super Bowl. How do they do this? Right? The market's designed so that that can't happen. Well, obviously, there's a lot of reasons for it. There's a lot of stuff behind the story. But one of the things that is most striking is that at a very early point in his career, Brady learned to put self-interest aside. Now, this sounds almost counterintuitive. You guys are business owners. As business owners, what happens to you and your business and what happens to yourself is your predominant focus. 
right? That's, it's obvious. So operating in self-interest is something that comes absolutely naturally and comes with the territory. But I'll tell you what happens when you put self-interest aside, and I'll tell you how Brady did it. What he decided when they started winning Super Bowls was, I want to be the best player that ever lived. That was his drive. And there's a bunch of other quarterbacks in that same league who have a different drive. I want to be the highest paid quarterback in the league because I'm the best and because I deserve it. And so there are any number of QBs who've come through the system who've been paid heaps more than Brady. And their name will be forgotten in a year or two years. And in fact, for most of you here, you never would have heard it anyway. But interestingly enough, while others are chasing the money that they think they're worth, Brady's going, I want to keep winning. I want to be the best of all time. What does it take to be the best of all time? Sure, there's a whole bunch of stats about passing and all that sort of stuff, but I want to win championships. That's what I want to do. So what did he do? While all the other QBs are getting as much money as they can, he's going, I'm going to sacrifice my salary because I know we need stronger players in other positions. It doesn't matter how well I throw that football if there's no one on the other end of it to catch it. It doesn't matter how good I am in the pocket if I haven't got an offensive line that keeps the guys away from me that are trying to rip my head off. So he freed up a bunch of money so that his team could go and buy better players in different positions to get a stronger overall team. And so what he did by putting self-interest aside was to enable the possibility of a team that achieved more than it was supposed to be able to achieve and has done so year after year after year after year. And so six Super Bowl champions, he's the youngest quarterback to ever win a Super Bowl and the oldest quarterback to ever win a Super Bowl, 2001 and 2018. All right, that's a pretty good record for one person to have. So what I would say to you is, when you think about your team, what is it that makes your team the strongest? What is it that is going to enable you to achieve your results in the long term by having the strongest team you possibly can and bringing out their best performance? No one's going to walk into your business each day and say, gee, I really hope I make Jenny some money today. I'd really like her to be super rich. That's not what goes through people's heads when they come into the, to, to the work site each day. That's not what they're thinking. They want to have a great job. They want to be satisfied and fulfilled. Sure, they want the business to do well, but they're not going to be driven by your financial success. And if you recognize that and then use that as a motivator to bring out the best that your team has, you're going to be in a pretty good space. And that shit is sustainable. It doesn't come and go. It's not fleeting. You build that into your culture and that is sustainable excellence. Now, I love this image, but this is the part of the presentation where I'm really in danger of talking shit that I know nothing about. Right? I, I know nothing about planes and flying and aerobatic displays or anything else, but this says one thing to me. When I saw this image, what it says to me is, that is a high-performing team. Now, let me just step back for a minute. I can't count the number of times I have had someone sit in an, interview, in, in, in an interview room in front of me and tell me that they build high-performing teams. I can't tell you how many times I've read a resume that says, I build high-performing teams. And I look at that and I go, oh, this would be interesting. Why don't you talk me through that? And you only have to scratch the surface that much to find out that for most people, they don't even know what a high-performing team is. Now, high-performing teams are characterized by a few things. What most people think they're characterized by are, um, everyone got on well together, we all collaborated, there wasn't much dissension, we all had fun, it was a high-performing team. No, no, that's not a high-performing team. High-performing teams First and foremost, get results. If you're not getting results, what's the point? 
What are you there for? So the first thing is you've got to get results. But look at these guys up there. I, I know nothing about flying, but I can tell you a few things about that team. Guess what? Number one, no tourists. There are no tourists up there. Everyone is carrying their weight. Everyone's carrying their weight. Everyone individually has to be on their game and excellent. Tell you something else about the team. How much tolerance do you think they have for shenanigans? For people who don't want to conform to the culture, who, people who want to do it their own way, people who want to be mavericks. I heard a Top Gun theme earlier. Nice work, John. For people who want to be maverick. Like, there's no room for that. Tell you something else. You don't get into one of those planes unless you want to be the best of the best. That drive for excellence, that drive for being the best you can possibly be and pushing yourself and stretching yourself to your limits. That's a high-performing team. What else? Well, you've got to have the discipline to do things that aren't natural. So when you learn to fly a plane, apparently, once again, I'm in danger of talking shit here, I've never done it. But once again, you learn to fly by looking at the instrumentation panel. And that's how you learn to fly a plane. You keep your eye on the dials. When you get into a formation like that, the thing you have to concentrate on is the wingtip of the plane next to you. And so having the discipline to disconnect your natural tendency to come back to the panel and to look at the wingtip of the person in front of you, that takes mental control. It takes emotional control and it takes concentration. So those are the types of things that, for me, determine what a high-performing team is. But guess what? Most of us aren't prepared to do what it takes to build one of them. Why? Because it's hard. High-performing teams don't just form themselves. And you've got to start back at the individual level. So let's start talking about strong leadership. Why is strong leadership so important? Because you have to be strong enough to not accept any performance that doesn't conform, that isn't consistent to what you need to be able to do to make that happen. And when I say individual performance has to be a must, you have to hire for that. And when you don't hire the right person, because I've got to tell you, shit, how many times have I hired the wrong person? Countless number of times. And Kern was talking before about the cost of a bad hire, 60 to 80,000, right? You get up into senior levels, the cost of a hire is 200K plus in an organisation, a large organisation. So you've got to try and hire the right person. And you've got to do that and not be satisfied until you have the right people in those individual roles. What you've got to remember is that it's a lot easier to rein in a stallion than it is to flog a donkey. Right? It, it is. How many of you in your businesses are flogging donkeys? Seriously, they're fun to ride, but they're not going to get over the finish line first. They're sure-footed when you're going down through the Grand Canyon. Has anyone ever done that? It's awesome. They're sure-footed. Well, they're actually mules. They're across. But anyhow, let's go. So, so they're not going to take you to victory. But this is where rationalisation creeps in. This is where, as leaders, we can think of a thousand excuses as to why we shouldn't do something, why we shouldn't have a difficult conversation with someone, why we shouldn't terminate someone's employment and free them up to be successful in another organisation. Because that's hard. That's the hard work of leadership. And if you're not strong enough to do that, well, that's okay. That's fine. Just don't bullshit yourself and don't bullshit me that you've got a high-performing team. Because you don't. And at some point in time, your results will prove to you that you don't have a high-performing team. Because I see so many businesses that grow and grow and grow and they're going fantastically well. Bang! They hit a ceiling. They can't grow anymore. You know why? Because the leader hasn't grown enough to make it any different. 
Nothing happens without a leader making it happen. Sorry, nothing different happens without a leader making it happen. Lots of shit happens without a leader making it happen. And in fact, in a lot of the really large companies I've worked for, I, I used to say, you know, you could actually bomb head office. You could implode the thing. And it would be, I don't know, two weeks, three weeks before anyone out in the operations knew that head office was missing. It's true, right? The, the <laughs> Sorry? Except for the pay department. Except for the pay department, yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay, so fortnight, two weeks. Yeah, fortnight, fortnightly pay when the pay doesn't turn up in the account. That's right. But this is, this is the way the world works, right? So do you have the strength, the courage, and the discipline to build one of them? And can you put the right people in place so that they will actually regulate each other? Because if you get this right, that team is self-regulating. They won't tolerate any crap from their teammates because guess what? Up at that altitude, like, that shit will kill you. That will kill you if you don't get that right. And so when I was chief executive at CS Energy, um, I had five direct reports to me, five executives who reported to me directly, and I had to replace them nine times. So, in other words, in my five years there, I had nine people rotate through those roles. So some people in some roles I had to replace more than once. Because guess what? I didn't always get it right. And that's really expensive and it's really disruptive. But on the flip side of that, you've got to think that if you haven't got the best person for the role, you need to get the best person for the role. You don't tolerate underperformance or lack of capability because guess what? The standard you walk past is the standard you set. And if you're not actually creating the right standard for performance and behavior in your leaders, that flows all the way through down the line and it's a cancer in your organization. So you can't afford to let that stuff persist. All right. Here's a conversation. Leadership happens eyeball to eyeball. It's human interaction. And every day, when people come into work, they want to know three basic things. It's not hard. They want to know three things. Number one, what are your expectations of me? Number two, how am I actually going against those expectations? How's my performance? And number three, what does my future hold? Three really simple things. Who here in this room is confident, I'm going to ask for a show of hands, who here is confident that everyone who works in their company knows those three things? Show of hands, confidence. Okay, right, that's, that's good. That's what I expected. Right? Not many of you can say with clarity and confidence that your people know those three things. But that's the prerequisite. That is the ground floor foundation on which you will build a relationship with your people. If they don't know that, you've got problems. So I like to talk about what I call the leadership dialogue. And the leadership dialogue, once again, is a prerequisite to having a difficult conversation. You can't take on anything hard unless you have a relationship. And I want to make it really clear that when I talk about strong leadership, I don't talk about being a bitch or an asshole, being angry, being aggressive, being overbearing, being dominant. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the strength, the personal strength, to sit comfortably in an unemotional way, but in a connected way, in a conflict situation. Because conflict aversion is the root of all evil for a leader. Who believes that they are entirely comfortable in a conflict situation, just very relaxed and comfortable in it? Okay, that's more than I would have expected. That's fantastic. So if you can actually sit in a conflict situation and absorb it comfortably, whether it's an argument with your wife, whether it's a disagreement with someone at work, whether it's a negotiation, I see so many people who are smart as hell and they know their stuff, but they are poor negotiators. They've been trained in negotiation. They know all the techniques and the tactics, but they can't sit comfortably in conflict and that drives them to do dumb shit that drives them to say things they shouldn't say 
It drives them to turn off so that they're not listening properly. It drives them to make accommodations in the trade of terms that they shouldn't make because they get emotional and it clouds their judgment and they do dumb shit and it happens all the time in negotiation. There's one really important thing that I'd like you guys to be able to take away and this is just so important. If another human trusts and respects you, there is nothing you can't say to them. This is completely liberating. If a human being trusts and respects you, there is nothing you can't say to them. So when you're in this type of situation where you're having leadership dialogue, this is a friendly conversation. Now, I've got to tell you, I've been through in various, you know, testing I've done and so forth before being hired into roles, I've been through emotional intelligence testing where they show you photos of different people's faces and you've got to tell them how much anger there is there and how much depression, how much anxiety, how much joy, all that sort of stuff. It's sort of, <laughs> it's hard to do. But I look at that photo and I go, look, that's a really relaxed situation. The power dynamic says that the woman on the right's the boss, probably. But the body language is open, a little bit of smile on the face, that's a friendly conversation. The leadership dialogue is about the daily interactions you have with your people. And those daily interactions should cover a whole lot of levels. So talking about the information flow, one of the things that I was always really, really um, diligent about was that I would talk to people right through the layers of the organisation, four, five, six layers down, and right across the breadth of the organisation. Not all the time, but this is how I found out whether what I was getting fed from my executive was good, bad, or indifferent. And I'd find out what stuff was being glossed over and dressed up and being looked at with rose-coloured glasses. I'd work out what was really going on with the culture. Because you can't go down and talk to uh, an electrical fitter in a power station at 2 o'clock in the morning without them telling you a few things. Oh, I've got 10 minutes with the CEO? Well, let me tell you how life is here. And, and they will. And that's how you actually calibrate and find out whether the information that's flowing through to you is accurate or not. And you can do that in an organisation of, you know, 100, 1,000, 10,000 people if you're just sampling through the organisation just seeing what's going on. It's actually quite important. But where it all really happens is in the eyeball-to-eyeball, -eyeball, or the belly-to-belly, -belly, as some people call it, interactions that you have with the people who work for you and report to you directly. There's two reasons for that. The first reason is that those are generally the hardest ones. They're the people that you have the relationship with day in and day out that you really want to like you. Because let's face it, I'm not saying you should be an asshole. You, like, we like to be liked. Like, we all love to be loved. There's nothing wrong with that. It just has to be subordinate to the need to be respected and the need to drive value for the organisation and for the people in it. So, I've forgotten where I was now. So, with those two having the conversation... Number one, I want to be liked, I don't want to risk that. Number two, guess what? No one knows whether I'm having this conversation or not. No one knows. I'm the only person who knows. I can get away with not having this conversation because I'm the only one. And so I sort of know that I should say something to Jenny because her performance has been up to scratch, but I've got all this other stuff I have to do today. And the number of rationalizations that we can come up with to stop us from having conversations that we know we need to have is staggering. The creativity of the human brain is ever staggering, right? Because we can come up with so many things, okay? Here's a couple of them. Um, I just need to give him more time. She'll be okay if I give him more time, I'll let her go. Uh, how about this? Uh, John's a highly paid executive. He should know what to do. He shouldn't need me to tell him. How about this? Uh, I'm not sure that I've got enough evidence of that behavioural performance. So I'm afraid that if I actually start talking about it, they'll catch me out and I can't actually justify what I'm saying. How about, look, I know they're really weak in this area, but they're sort of pretty good at that, so on the balance of things, I think they're okay. That sort of stuff is the stuff that disempowers you and your people and just takes away from the amount of value that you can drive through your business. 
Because if you're not the person who's a strong leader who can at any point in time say, hey, listen, we just need to have a chat about something. And to sit down and calmly and rationally in an empathetic and connected way have that conversation, then your ability to drive the culture and performance of your organisation is severely limited. There's going to come a point where you can't get results anymore unless you can do that thing. So for the next little while, what I want to do is help you to get over this. And this is the meat and potatoes of today. When you are faced with conflict, you will find that facing into that conflict willingly is 90% will and 10% skill. So a lot of people say, hey, I'm not sure what I'd say if I had that conversation. What if I get tongue-tied or I trip up or I get asked a question I don't know how to answer or whatever the case may be? Forget about that. It's 90% will. If you can get your head around stepping forward and putting yourself into the conversation, the rest will follow. You'll be crap at it at first. That's okay. Don't worry about it. Right? When I first started doing this stuff, I was as bad as any of you and worse than most. Okay? But I had just enough self-awareness, just enough ability to be introspective, to realise that I was bad at it. And fortunately for me, I was also just a little bit dysfunctional. And so whereas most people go into a situation like that and they walk out and they go, that was terrible, I'm never doing that again. And then they avoid it. And then any time another opportunity comes up, they'll find an excuse to not do it. They won't have the hard conversation. And this becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Because the only time a hard conversation ever gets held is when it is absolutely impossible to avoid. And then you go in and guess what? you're really crap and you have a bad conversation. It reinforces that it's hard and it reinforces that you're not good at it. And so it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. And so what are you going to do naturally? You're going to avoid it. I say to people, this is like learning to ski in deep powder snow. Does it, is it any skiers here? Right, if you've skied in Australia, you learn to ski on ice. It's hard packed and you point your skis down the slope and you look for a patch of snow to turn on that may have fallen overnight. And it might be a metre by a metre and a half and that's where you know you turn because otherwise you're on ice. Then all of a sudden, you find yourself in Colorado in two metres of fluffy light powder snow and you've never seen it before. Now you can go and get a lesson and the instructor will say to you, Marty, here's how you do your pole plant, Here's how you position your weight over the skis. Here's how much weight to put on the inside ski and the outside ski. Blah, 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 blah. Doesn't matter. It's one of those things where you've just got to do it for long enough until it feels okay. That's it. You've got to accept the fact that when I start doing this, it's going to feel crap. I'm going to spend most of my day digging my skis out of the powder trying to find them. That's how I'm going to spend most of my day for the first day or two when I'm doing this. But all of a sudden... One day you get up and you put the planks on and you go, this actually feels good. I can actually do this. But it only happens with repeated trying, repeated effort, and repeatedly putting yourself back into that frame. So what I did when I came out of my first few really, really, really bad performance feedback conversations with my people, I knew that I was no good at it. And I knew why. The reason was because back in those days, I was an arrogant little fuck. I was. And I would sit down with someone who wasn't performing and I'd say, hey, look, you're not doing this. I need you to do this. If you can't, get out of my way. I'll fucking show you how to do it. Right? That was how I led. And it was disastrous. Can you imagine if someone actually said that to you? I wasn't kidding when I said I was worse than most. But the whole thing was I realized that if I was going to be a competent leader, that is a core skill. That is entry level. That is foundational. And so being dysfunctional, what I did is that I threw myself into every situation I could find where I had the opportunity to do that again and to try to improve and to do it better. And that was the only thing that saved me. And because of that, over the years, I became super, super competent at it. And so it doesn't matter what the situation is, whether it's a negotiation, 
whether it's a meeting with a, you know, a hostile board of directors, whether it's a one-on-one -on -one conversation with one of my people, I walk in there, I don't even think about it. It's natural, it's part of me. I connect, I listen, I understand. I know what messages I need to get across. It takes zero preparation for me. But that took years and years and years and years to hone. And so for you, as business owners, you've got to work out what type of business you want, what type of culture you want, what type of people you want, and what standard you're going to set. Someone asked me a few years ago as chief executive, what does a CEO actually do? What do you do? And I thought about it for a while and I didn't answer straight away. I said, I'll get back to you on that one because I hadn't really thought about what a CEO does at, at the core, at the essence. And I came back with the answer that said, as CEO, I do three things. I set the tone, I set the pace, and I set the standard for this business. I set the tone, the pace, and the standard. And that is true of you and your businesses. You're the ones who get to set the tone, the pace, and the standard for your business. And that's really important because as you get bigger, that's the thing that's going to most determine your performance is the tone, the pace, and the standard. And as CEO, I could be completely unreasonable. In fact, that's an expectation, completely unreasonable about the pace that I set, never being happy with the pace because it's always too slow. And that's okay, that's my job. And I've got to do it in a realistic way, but I've still got to be unreasonable about time frames. And I've got to set a standard that people know is the standard they have to meet. You can't set a standard and say, here's the standard for behavior and performance, uh, but for this person over here, I'm going to make an exception. Right? Well, how does that work for you? You've just told everyone that the standard you're setting is not actually the standard. This is the standard down here. And you've also taught them something else, which they probably already knew, but it's always good to reinforce this. You've also told them, don't worry about what comes out of my mouth, because a lot of shit comes out of my mouth. Just watch what I do. People don't watch your lips. They watch your feet. They see what you do. And that's the thing that reinforces where they should be. So with something like this, this sort of situation, you need to build trust and respect with your people. That happens in the everyday conversations. You don't do that by only talking about transactional things. You don't, only, you don't do that by only talking about work things. You do that by listening and by letting something of yourself into that conversation so that people can understand you a little bit. So they know what drives you, so they understand your intent. They don't just know what's on the work program. They know what you're trying to achieve. They know why you're trying to achieve it. And they know what makes you tick just a little bit. Now, the real difficult part with this, the real subtlety, is that with your people, you need to be friendly, but not friends. Being friends is a different dynamic. And being friends can make business a hell of a lot harder. Now, I know that some of you are growing up in businesses where you're friends. God, I'm in business with my daughter, right? And it's always going to make a difference as to how you approach things. Because number one, if you're dealing with a friend who's an employee or a leader who reports to you, then you're going to give them a lot of latitude. And when you have to make decisions, those decisions are super hard. I've hired friends before. I don't do it anymore. I've hired friends who are really competent and have a good track record, but they just haven't worked out. And I've had to take the hard pill and sack them. And I've had, I've had people who've worked for me as executives in an organization where their wife and my wife are really good friends. But guess what? You don't do the job. I still have to sack you. And it's always too painful and too hard and has too much emotional crap tied up in it. So guess what? I just don't do it anymore. Heaps of good people on the market, right? The other thing about friends is that they will take advantage of the relationship. Whether they do it consciously or subconsciously, whether they know it or not, there will be a point in time where they will take advantage of the relationship because they know you will give them that latitude. So the trick with this and the real subtlety is they need to understand you, they need to know you a bit, and you need to know them. But not to the point where they abuse the privilege. And with that line, 
It's going to be different for every individual. So you've got to actually use your judgment for that as a leader. And that's all about judgment. So the next few minutes, we're going to talk about how you get over this fear and discomfort and unwillingness to have hard conversations. And we're going to talk about it in the context of the people who work for you directly. The people who work for you directly are the hardest ones, as we mentioned before. So I'm going to give you five lenses that you can look through. These five things are designed specifically so that they help you get your head around why you need to give people honest, direct feedback. They need to know, what do you, ex uh, what do you expect of me? How am I going against those expectations and what does my future hold? You can't have that unless you're a strong leader who can have conversations every day that calibrates people and lets them know where they are. Number one, you have a duty of care to your people. Now, I heard someone say before they're in the construction game, is anyone in construction, manufacturing, trades works, like where there's, show of hands quickly, okay, quite a few of you, right. You have a duty of care to your people to keep them safe. The only thing, the only thing that ever kept me awake at night when I ran CS Energy was the possibility of a person being seriously injured or killed. And that was an ever-present possibility. I knew every day that I was the CEO there. And for five years, I've got to tell you, I got away with it. When I say I got away with it, that organisation had great safety statistics, right? We had a lost time injury frequency rate, for anyone who understands that language, of 0 0.6. Right? So it's, it, they call that world class. But guess what? I knew that the culture, the leadership, and the processes in that organisation did not guarantee the safety of every individual. And as long as I knew that, that was the only thing that kept me awake at night. You know, in a business that big, you lose 10 million, you make 10 million, no one really notices next week. Right? It's, it's lost in the numbers. And large organisations are super resilient to stuff-ups. So that's okay. And I know people who've done this. I know guys who have had people die on their watch and it never leaves them, ever. Ever. You have mistakes that cost you money, you get over it, you grow past it. But if you've ever had to sit down with someone and tell them why their spouse isn't coming home from work, that is something that never leaves you. So you have a duty of care to your people in that regard. Is that going to be enough to get you to get your head around sitting down and talking to someone who's not performing at the right standard or who's not behaving the right way and sit down and talk to them and tell them why it's not appropriate and why you need more from them and why the standard needs to be set here. Because that's something you have to do. And I've actually sat down with an executive in the past and said, if anything happens at this power station, if anyone gets hurt there, seriously, I will never forgive you and I will never forgive myself. Because we know, we know that the general manager who's running that site is not a strong enough leader for us to be confident that people are safe. And that's how seriously you have to take it. Now, not everyone's working in industrial businesses, and that's okay. But even when you think about the mental well-being of people. And so, for example, I've heard many entrepreneurs say to me, I really worry, I agonise over the fact that I'm responsible for these people's employment. And I've got to make payroll, and it's a really big deal because I've got to keep these people employed. right? They're, well, in my world, that's probably one of the last things you should worry about. Okay, you need to worry about growing your business and making it profitable and sustainable. But this whole thing about being responsible for other people's financial situation is sort of ridiculous. Like, when they join your business, they know they're not stepping into BHP Billiton or Commonwealth Bank of Australia. They know that. They understand the risk. And everyone makes their choices, and they choose to be with you. And so worrying about whether or not you can pay them next week or whether you have to let a few people go, that's not the focus you should have. In my view, you should be focusing on how you as a leader either adds to or detracts from their mental health and well-being every day. The incidence of mental health illness in Australia is massive. 
almost 50% of Australians medicate daily for anxiety, depression, or addiction. Almost 50% of all Australians. So when they come to your company and work for you, what do they see? Do they have a strong leader who can help them to go away better than they walked in? Or do they have a weak leader who's not going to uphold any sort of standard? So the duty of care is number one. Now, if that's not enough to convince you that you need to have a strong leadership dialogue where you can have any conversation, no matter how difficult, with your people, then don't worry, I've got four more. You can't get results from a subpar team. You can't. And once you know that, this is your capital at risk. This is your capital. It's your money that you're risking here. Why would you leave an obvious source of value underdone, or even worse, completely push it off the table, once you understand that you can get, can't get results from a subpar team? So we've spoken a bit about high-performing teams and how they're built, but it starts with the individuals. It starts with the individuals in the team. Get the best individuals you can and then work on them to help them to become their best. Number three, your people deserve the opportunity to improve. Now, does this actually move you into action? Does this get you to put your fear and discomfort aside so that you can do what you need to do as a strong leader? I can't tell you the number of people that I have sat down across a table from and given them feedback that they have never heard before. At the age of 30, 40, 50, even 60 years old, they've gone through their whole career and they have not come across one leader who had the guts to tell them what they could see as a very obvious problem with their performance or behaviour. And it's for me, heartbreaking. I look at people and I go, this thing that I'm seeing, it's actually not something that's intractable. Like, you could fix this problem if you would only get after it and I can coach you and give you a bit of help with that. But you sit down with people who have never been told about something, and this has hampered their career. It's probably hampered the way they live. It's probably been a problem in their relationships. And if I can observe that, I'm not going to hold back doesn't matter how uncomfortable I feel about talking about it, I'm going to sit down with them and say, hey, look, here's what I've noticed about you. And for the way you need to be in this role or in this organisation, I think that's a showstopper and I'll tell you why. If you want to work on it, I'll help you. If you don't, it's completely up to you. I understand and I respect your choices, but you can't be here. And so giving people the opportunity to improve, the sad thing is that the older we get, the more we tend to believe our, our story, where we are now. And so I've said to people, look, you know, here's something obvious I've seen. They're going in the back of their mind. Yeah, sure, Marty, but guess what? My last five bosses told me I was doing really well. So you, you Johnny come lately, you must be wrong. And that's incredibly sad. Everyone deserves the opportunity to improve. You as a leader, as a strong leader, have to give them that opportunity. If you see something about their performance or behaviour that you think you can help them with, they need to know. Number four, everyone knows the strong and weak performers. Everyone knows. Everyone knows. As leaders, sometimes, it's like emperor's new clothes. Maybe no one will notice. Everyone knows who the strong and weak performers are. And if you don't deal with the weak performers... It's a cancer for your culture because, once again, you're saying, I'm going to set the standard here. Oh, but I'm going to make an exception for John because John can't reach that standard and I'm just going to ignore that. And everyone sees that. So all of a sudden, you've just created another problem. The first problem is you've got a weak, non-performance-driven culture. The second one is that now everyone knows that you are a weak as piss leader because you're not prepared to deal with the poor performers. Is this the thing that's going to get you into action? It's all will. Skill will come. Just have the conversations. Finally, if the worst comes to worst and you do have to let someone go, well, you better be pretty sure that you've done everything you possibly can, everything within your power, to actually help them to improve. 
Now, uh, one of my sisters, I have three sisters and a brother, so as my father used to say, he married a Catholic who couldn't count. And my older sister has been working in large business as an HR executive for many, many years. So I've heard pretty much everything there is to hear about how senior people behave. And she said, it's amazing how many times a very senior leader will walk into her office and say, I, I, need, to get, I need to get rid of Greg. I, I need you to help me. I need to get rid of Greg. And she'll go, okay, well, talk me through it. What's been happening? How much have you been working with Greg? And what are the conversations you've had to help Greg to understand where he's not meeting the performance bar? Oh, well, he should know. He's a highly paid executive. He should know. And so Greg has never heard about it. And this weak leader will go to HR and say, you need to make this person disappear. I'm not going to take accountability for the fact that I'm the one making the decision. I'm not going to take accountability for the fact that I should have been able to lift their performance, but I want them gone. Now, if you need to make a decision that hard and that tough, you want to know you've done everything you can and given them every opportunity. Don't get too tied up in this, though. Don't agonise over it because... Everyone makes their choices every day about how they present in their employment. They make choices about their behaviour. They make choices about how much discretionary effort they're going to give you. They make choices about how many smoke breaks they're going to have and how many times they're going to spend their time Googling the interweb instead of doing the work they're supposed to be doing. Everyone makes their choices, right? As a leader, you get to operate the scoreboard. So here's the scoreboard. I'm not seeing the score tick over. Why not? Let me try and help you. Here's how you make the score tick over, right? Do you understand that? Right, let's go. But if you get to that choice where you have to make the ultimate decision, you had better be sure that you've done your part as a leader and then the rest is up to them. Okay, so that's five really good reasons why you need to get your head around not delaying, not procrastinating, not making excuses but having those difficult conversations with the people you need to, eyeball to eyeball, respectfully, empathetically, and in a connected way. And this takes years to perfect, but it starts with your will. Okay. <laughs> I, love, I actually love the fact I follow Kerwin. Right. Who will say now that they commit to having the conversation... I reckon everyone in this room knows that there's a conversation you should have had that you have not had yet. Every single one of you. And you know what the conversation is and you know the person you need to have it with. Who is going to commit to having that conversation as soon as they next get the opportunity? Right? I commit. My, okay, you know the drill, right? <laughs> my word is my truth. My truth is my bond. Okay, you know that stuff, right? And you need to go away and take that to heart. Because if you walk out of here and you turn up back in your business on Monday and you don't do that, you will never do it, ever. You'll spend your life in fear of having those conversations. And that's not a good thing. It's not a good thing to live with fear and avoidance because that actually eats away at you. Not to mention the fact that your business will go nowhere in terms of its culture and people. All right, I just want to finish off quickly with a couple of things, right? In terms of execution, as a strong leader, one of the most important things that you can do is to set the right accountability structure and to empower people to actually do that. So, does everyone understand accountability? There's a reason why I have this slide here. Weak accountability cultures are characterised by management by committee, and decision-making by consensus. Lots and lots and lots of meetings and conversations. No clear decision because there's no clear decision-maker. And when it comes to accountability, it has to be single-point accountability. There is one chair and one spotlight. And you've got to work out who to put in that chair for every single thing that you do, for every single thing that happens in your business. And for anything that comes up, the question, who's doing this, should be met immediately with a name because there always has to be one head to pat, one ass to kick for everything. One head to pat, one ass to kick, that's it. Shared accountability is no accountability. And you've got to be able to trace the accountability for delivering value to a name, 
to a person, to an individual. And that's absolutely essential if you want to get outcomes. Because guess what? People behave really, really differently if they have accountability for something. Really differently. So you've got to put them under the hot lights. You've got to put them in a situation where they know they're carrying the can. And whether this thing gets implemented or not, whether the value gets delivered, whether the, whether the program is delivered on time to budget everything else, that's on them. Now, we're going to talk about empowerment in a minute because accountability and empowerment are the, are the two sides of the same coin. But in terms of accountability, don't be afraid to make people singularly and directly accountable for getting stuff done. And don't be afraid to stretch them. This is going to put people under performance pressure and it's going to stress them out. But that's a really good thing, right? Because you all understand the positive effects of stress, don't you? So you've heard of the Yerkes Dodson theory, which basically says performance improves with stress up to a certain point and then it starts to diminish. So up to a certain point, stress is enormously positive. And then sometimes, if stress gets too great, it sort of falls off a cliff. But the perfect place for performance to get the very, very best out of an individual is at that intersection point between boredom and anxiety. And so you have to be able to push your people to that limit. And in fact, just a tiny fraction over. They reckon 4% over is the perfect place to have someone. You're stretching them to where they didn't know they could go. You're helping them to achieve things they didn't think they could achieve. Not only is that best for you, for your company and for your team, but it's actually best for the individual. Because as I've grown older, I sort of feel that I am less and less certain about practically everything. But this is one thing I'm certain about. All self-esteem is driven through the achievement of difficult goals, whatever they happen to be. And I actually firmly believe this. So when you make someone accountable, you have to set them up with high expectations for delivery. You have to make sure they know that they are the only person that's doing that and that it rests on them. And so they're accountable for getting the results. If you don't do this, it's okay because things will bumble along. But if you want to be able to execute brilliantly and get the results you didn't know you could achieve, that's the way to do it. It's a prerequisite. Otherwise, you'll get what you get. And it'll depend somewhat on people's own standards for behaviour and performance. But unless you have a single point accountability, everyone's going to want to have their two bobs worth. Everyone's going to want to chip in. Everyone's going to want to have a say. And some people who are opinion leaders will also want to use power of veto if there's something they don't like. But making someone accountable means they are the ones solely and wholly responsible for getting something done. But let's talk about empowerment. And um, I'm a huge fan of irony, so putting, uh, putting a photo of a political cabinet meeting in New Zealand is hugely ironic to me. But it does actually tell us one important thing about accountability, is that everyone has to have a role and they have to understand their role and they have to understand who the decision maker is. And there's a lot of clarity in that because everyone knows who's cooking the chook. We have a minister for defence. We have a minister for home affairs. We have a prime minister. Everyone knows where the accountabilities lie, and that's sort of useful. But the thing that is most important is that when you give someone accountability for something, they also have to have the power to get it done. And it's such an easy trap to fall into to say, OK, you're empowered to get this stuff done, but guess what? I'm going to second guess your decisions. And in fact, sometimes, because I'm the business owner, I reserve the right to step in and overrule your decisions. So all of a sudden, you've just disabled the accountable person. And you have unwittingly, and without any sort of understanding that you're doing this, transferred the accountability to yourself. Because if you start making decisions of someone below you who's accountable for something, you've just transferred the accountability to yourself. And they will go, fine, Marty. You want to make the call, you make the call. But guess what? If it all turns to shit, it's your call, not mine. I, I can only do so much, and let's face it, you're the boss. Now, when someone says to you, okay, you're the boss, do you know what they're actually saying? You are a complete muppet. 
I know that you can make me do this because I want this job and you have power over me because you own the business and so I will toe the line, but I think you're wrong. My respect for you has just gone down and I think you're a complete numpty. Right? So when someone says to you, okay, you're the boss, I just want you to understand what that translates to. So to empower people, clear direction, really clear outcomes and clear goals. They need to know what's there. Decision rights. They've got to be given the ability to make decisions themselves. They have to have a scoreboard. You've got to know what good looks like. And so it's got to be really clear to them what they need to do to be successful. Really important. They need your availability. You don't just send them away on something and say, come, to back, come back to me in six months when it's done. They need to be able to ask questions. They need to be able to calibrate. They need to be able to test things on you. So you've got to be there for them to do that. There's a whole range of things that we can do to give people this empowerment. But it's got to be theirs. It's two sides of the same coin and you cannot separate accountability and empowerment. Does that make sense? That's about execution excellence. And unless you're a strong leader who's going to set the right standards, stretch the people, tell them when they're getting off track, expect excellence, look at the scoreboard and tell them when the scoreboard's not moving, unless you're going to do that, They'll just bumble along and you might get good results and you might not. But if it's my capital at risk, I want to make sure that I'm a bit more in control of those results. Okay, um, traps for young players. Traps for young players. We've mentioned the fact that if you step down into someone's accountability, then you've disempowered them and you've completely changed the culture of the organisation. And so the example I gave before about that executive who was running operations and I said, if something happens in this power station, I'll never forgive you. Why didn't I just go in and sack the general manager? Well, why didn't I do that? Like I knew. Why didn't I just go and sack the general manager? Because it wasn't my call. It was the executive's call who reported to me. Now, I could have done that, but I figure I've always got a choice, but my choice has to be sensible. And so if I felt that strongly about it, that I was going to sack the general manager, guess what? I have to sack the executive too. Because I can't step in underneath and say, I've made a decision that affects you, and by the way, you're going to live with that now. Very, very difficult thing to do as a leader. And so making the choice that says, if you're not prepared to do that and I feel strongly enough about it, then I will do it for you, but it's just told me that you and I are completely at odds. We are not on the same page. And if that's the case, that's fatal. And so there's always a choice. Don't ever step down into the accountability of a person who's working for you. And we've already covered off the fact that no one will ever do it as well as you. That's okay. Get used to it. Your individual brilliance will only get you so far. And as your business gets bigger, you will find it harder and harder and harder just to crank the handle. Um, one of the other things that I think is very important is that you have to expect people and demand that they be adults. If something goes wrong, that's okay. We need to have a conversation about it. Don't come to me if you've got a project that's supposed to be delivered in three months' time. Don't come to me after two months and three and a half weeks and tell me you've got a problem. You need to be adult. Come to me and ask me for help. Come to me and tell me this changed circumstances. Come to me and tell me about the problems you've got. I'm not going to be down there in your knitting trying to work out what's going on. The onus is on you to come to me. So one of the things I see quite often is people not being forced to be adults in the workplace. So if you can do a couple of these really, really simple things, they are going to multiply your strength as a leader. People will look at you differently. They will respond differently to how you talk because you are demonstrating that what's most important to you is the performance of the business, doing the right things for the right reasons when they need to be done, irrespective of your personal discomfort, irrespective of self-interest. Remember the Tom Brady story. We're going to put self-interest aside here because we want to be a champion team. And I know how to do it, and I'm prepared to do it, and I'm personally strong enough to do it. And that's the thing that will make all the difference. Thanks very much, guys.
Mate, it's a long walk from back there. Sorry. It's a long, <laughs> how are you, mate? It's good, mate. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, Marty Moore. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Mate, well done. Do you, want, do you want to do any questions, or is that I know we're, we're really a little bit tight for time? Yeah. Actually, but why don't we just say we'll take three questions. Let's do three. We can only do three because we're a little bit tight for time. But I'm sure you would agree, oh, mate. Yeah. Thank you so much that for your experience. Yeah. It was really. Wouldn't you agree? Like that was to get this kind of experience in the room like this, with the depth, you know, and the the, the length and yeah, what you've been through and what you've done, Thanks. mate. It's an honour. So thank you very much. Thanks, um, three questions from the room, super quick. Make them good quality questions that everyone will benefit from. So let's go. All right, they're already there. Start with Red. Hello, my name's Ray. Hi, Ray. Um, obviously, the best way to give performance feedback is if you're not doing it by yourself. What some of the best methods that you've come across that enables you to get multi-rater feedback? That is. Feedback that's coming back from not just you as a supervisor or manager, but multiple people in the organisation to really round out a, a good picture for, for how that person is really performing. Okay. Um, thanks for the question, Ray. Three things. First thing is 360 degree feedback is useful if you have a large enough sample size, but in some organisations it's not large enough, so just be aware of that. Second thing is culturally, you've got to set up a culture in your leadership team where people are prepared to tell other people how they're performing and how they're behaving. So you look at that slide of the aerobatic display team, they would have no hesitation in telling someone in that team if they stepped out of line. When all else fails, number three, you're the boss. Your opinion counts. And if someone's working for you, and I don't pull out the boss card very often, in fact, you should pull it out extremely rarely, but if you need to, hey, it's only my opinion, but guess what? Uh, you work for me, and my opinion's sort of important. So, yeah, those three in order. All right, Luke, one, one, two, three. Green. Oh, hi, hi, Marty. Uh, my name's Nathan. Nathan, how are you? Thank you. That was absolutely awesome. We got so much out of that. Um, just on your how to have difficult conversations, your third point, staff deserve the opportunity to, Im to improve. What length of rope do you give them? How far do you go? Yeah, great question. Um, so I think you sort of tend to ratchet up as time goes on. So the first thing is just little minor tweaks. Okay, I can see this thing here, it could be an issue, you might want to have a look at this and change it. And then over time, you just become a little bit more and more prescriptive about the feedback you give. So if something becomes really obvious and if they're not listening, then you go harder on it. I would say, um, in my experience, three months is a lot of time. Three months is a lot of time. If you've had those early conversations and you're not seeing the change, three months from conversation one to decision about stay or go is normally a good rule of thumb. But it depends on individual circumstances. That's how I work. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks, Nate. One, two, three. All right. There was one more. Where did it go? Blue gone. Same question. All right. Well, look, we've got room for one more question. Maybe two. Come on. What have you got? All right. At the back. Oh, g'day, that was fantastic. Thanks very much. Uh, got a lot out of that. Um, just one question uh, in terms of stepping in and taking accountability yourself for other people's uh, performance. There are times in businesses and in life generally when uh, you can see a disaster and you can see something that's unfolding and like in my experience you could sort of step in and do something as opposed to sort of pass it on to the next person and then wait for them to do the right thing. Your experience in terms of, you know, for example, with, um, uh, with deaths in the workplace, if you see something that's really dangerous, like how would you approach that and how would you tidy it up afterwards? Yeah, that's, uh, that's actually a really, really good point because there are times when you just have to have a command and control mentality. So the safety in the workplace is a classic one. If you see someone, someone doing something that you think is really, really high risk, you need to stop them from doing it. It's, straight away. it's like having a two-year-old that you're trying to lead across the road. If they go to run out, what do you do? You don't just say, hang on, darling, maybe going out isn't the best thing. You yell at them, you know, whoa, stop! Like, that's what you do. And sometimes you find yourself in that situation. That's rare in my experience. It's not the thing that happens the most. But in terms of when you see something about to go wrong, the question is, how do you actually deal with it? Do you go in and stop them and tell them what they should be doing instead? Or do you ask them questions? So for example, an executive's about to make a decision. I know where their head's at. I know where they're going, and I'm not convinced it's the right decision. So 
So I call them in and just have a chat and say, hey, look, I know you've got the decision rights on this particular thing over here. How are you approaching it? Maybe you need to think about this. Have you considered that? And so asking them questions and letting them come to the same conclusion. It's very, very rare if you do that, that you'll need to overrule someone because what you're saying to them is, my expectations are A, B, C, and D. It's still your decision, but you need to know that your decision has consequences. And if you make that in opposition to the way I'm thinking, well, then you're on your own. Does anyone here ever get concerned about unfair dismissal laws? Who gets, like, who's looked at the laws and gone, fuck, <laughs> like, these aren't cool. I'm curious, maybe from all of your experience, how you handle, uh, I guess, the performance management side of things. Because obviously when you, someone's passed their probationary period, you know, they're basically then protected by this whole raft of laws, which really put us at a massive disadvantage, especially from a cultural perspective. So when you've identified that someone's not fitting, but they're, it's maybe at a later stage, do you have a methodology for performance management to ensure that you can exit someone, in some cases when required quickly, but also at the same time legally so that you're not creating liability for yourself. Yeah, absolutely. And um, one, of the, um, one of the things about my career is that I've worked with heavily industrialised workforces, heavily unionised workforces. Um, and, and it is a trick. So rule number one, never let someone through probation if you're not 100% certain. So even if you're only a little bit on the fence, don't let them through because in probation, they're showing you the best they've got. <laughs> and that ain't getting any better. Right? <laughs> it's, it's not. It's not. That's like, that's, that's the best you're ever going to get out it's of it. So it, it. It's their peak. It is. Peak. <laughs> that's it's right. their peak. But a couple of things about performance management and, and the industrial relations laws. One thing I learned is that it doesn't matter how much the unions fight for something or how much you know, people think it's a no-brainer. If you follow due process, you will be okay. And even the most left-wing, you know, for want of a better word, labour-driven commissioner will not rule against you if you have followed due process. You can make any decision that is sensible as long as you follow due process for your business. Second thing is document. Document everything, everything. You have a conversation, document it, make file notes. You have a hard conversation, send an email to the individual afterwards that says, I just want to confirm the points I covered in this conversation. So if you have a history of, I had this conversation on this date, this conversation on this date, this conversation on this date, clearly not getting it, had to go. And depending on the size of business and the level of union involvement, you, you can do that faster or slower. But that's, that's really the thing for me. Those are yeah, the two right. big things. Yeah. That's a big one. Yeah. That's a big one. All right. Well, that's, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Marty Moore. Now, are you going to hang around for the break? I am, yeah. yeah We're going to have a 15-minute break. The time now is 11.33. Uh, let's call it 11.30. So let's try and get back... To uh, here, 11.48. We'll call 11.48 to give you guys 11.40. Yeah, we'll call 11.48. Is that all right? Ladies and gentlemen, Marty Moore! Stop, stop. Mate, thank Thanks. you.